Welcome to Fox 2 Sierra. This is podcast guest number two on the podcast. Today we have Chris Fettis, um, former Navy SEAL. You, you were in 10 Correct. and then six. All right. Now he is a entrepreneur and a mad scientist of all things ice cream. He has a amazing ice company called Be Free, and we're going to get to all that in just a few moments. However, before we begin, we have something very unique about this particular podcast, and we're going to open with who wore it better. Do you know what I'm referencing? <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Who wore it better? We are both the Eagles and Angels limited edition Chris Fettis custom American flag hat. Is that right? Yeah, that's it. So why don't you tell us this? Let's start with this. Yeah, man. Um, so the intention was to move into uh, my ice cream startup. And this awesome guy, Tom, down in Southern Pines, former Delta Force guy, has this, you know, this brand Eagles and Angels down there. And I just, uh, we crossed paths at one point and um, sort of got to know each other a little bit. And he just, he asked me if I wanted to do a run and that's what he does for a business. So it's, it's, it's actually grown up a little bit now to where, um, you know, I, don't, I think he's not just choosing the folks he wants to do those runs with. But, you know, it's even a service if you had like a family member or somebody you knew that was a hero to you, um, you could contact them and they could send their uniforms in and get a, a run of hats or merchandise made, which is, it's just awesome. I think it's such a good cause. Um, he donates to tons of um, charities supporting soft and veterans and uh, just a good, good guy and a good program. So that's how uh, that, that happened. So he did a run for me in the hats. Um, and then we also used half of the uniform or part of the uniform for some belt buckles, which was a new thing then for him. And um, they sold out. So I was happy. So Chris, there's actually awesome. a piece of your uniform in the hat. That's right. Yeah. So he Amazing. takes, he takes the yeah. uniforms, cuts, chops them up and um, gets them made into these awesome hats. And now he's, has all sorts of different styles and, and stuff too. So it's, it's good. That's really fantastic. Right. Yeah, and when you, cool. you purchase one, you get this, this nifty little, you know, tag. Yeah. It lets you know whose uniform it is, what branch of the military, how you find them. Right. Yeah. And, and I got super John Hancock. All right. <laughs> the John Hancock. That is all right. That goes along with this hat. She has a little bit more value than, the ones that don't have this i'm just saying <laughs> just throwing that out there all right let's jump in chris where are you from my brother originally so i actually bounced around a lot growing up my dad was in the air force my my stepfather who actually i consider my father now um you know adopted us at a young age and we moved around a little bit every couple of years until around middle school high school time frame where we settled in Monterey, California. And so I kind of consider that my hometown just because most of my memories now from, you know, from there, I, I graduated high school from there. Um, and it was really the only place I was in long enough to even have to, to sort of form an attachment to, you know, hometown per se. So I consider that my hometown, but I've lived in, I was born in Texas. We lived in uh, Japan for a couple of years after that. South Carolina, North Carolina, Monterey, and um, then I joined the Navy, and, I've, and then, you know, I've been in Virginia most of my adult life, or all of my adult life, actually. Got it. And about siblings? Two sisters, both younger than me, and that's it. So they are with, uh, are nearby my parents in Salt Lake City, which is just where my father, my dad retired. Um after the Air Force and started working for Lockheed Martin and is now working for a different contract company doing um, sort of um, F-16 
and other types of aircraft sort of um, work, you know. Oh, that's fantastic. My dad growing up worked for Grummet. So he worked on the F-14 uh, from Top Gun fame, the E-2C Hawkeye, the EA-6 Prowler. Um, and I remember as a little kid going out to Bethpage here in Long Island, uh, Grummet three there, and I was really young, and I would watch the F-14s um, out at Bethpage. And then my dad would get these cool stickers and top clearance, top secret clearance um, badges, and I'd bring them to school, and everybody thought I was the biggest nerd. Nobody really appreciated <laughs> any of that. But like, such a loser. But you know, uh, I it was pretty really, cool. Yeah, uh, as a kid, and then when Top, yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Top Gun. Yeah. So when Top Gun came out, I was like, now I'm going to be the man because I had all these <laughs> autographed posts. Um, from the from actual pilots that, that piloted the uh, the F-14. And I knew all the specs and everything. And we had a, a manual at home with the breakdown of the, you know, the flight. And we had any, but it was cool as a kid. Have you seen the, that new Top Gun movie? I did. I loved it. I thought it was amazing. Dude, I only watched it like a couple days ago. I just never, I didn't think in my mind that it would be, even close to the same vibe, you know, wow, they did a good job with that movie. It was good. They did well, good. so good. Yeah, yeah, so yeah had that, it was amazing. Like the they, same vibe, the same vibe from the original movie, you know? Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> it, I, I'm not going to lie. I actually I actually teared up at, at a certain point in the movie. Um, so it, it definitely hit the feels, um, and yeah, I yeah. enjoyed it. I, I, can, I bought it, so I can watch that many, many times. Yeah. Um, all right, so so you said formidable years were Monterey, California. Yeah, yeah, good run there. Yep. Okay, so w were you like a typical California kid, skateboarding, surfing? <laughs> um, what a little bit of surfing like in your spare time. Yeah, it was cold water there, so I didn't really like the cold water, which is crazy because um, <laughs> through all my time in the teams, I didn't like cold water. Um, and then that, I've always, like that that's basically cold water is it wet and sandy for the first what six months or something like that i think it's the whole time you know <laughs> but uh yeah it's a good for sure it's a good you know it's a whole time actually because yeah it doesn't matter where you're at you're getting you're getting wet and sandy like all through it you know what i mean so all the way until buds ends and you kind of start the qualification training phase out in san diego which is another um a little less than a year before going to your team but um yeah cold water sucks but I, you know i really even after i got out of the navy six years ago um i it was the only time in my life that i actually started to, to develop a sort of love for cold water but it had to do with health you know cold plunging and yeah. uh, sort of like meditations and feeling feeling get, good sort of minimizing inflammation and all these sort of health benefits um a lot of a lot of upsides to my jujitsu performance and just my overall, you know, well-being physically. And now I'm now I love cold water. But I can't wait for my pool to freeze up so I can start jumping back in. Yeah. You jump into the freezer. Nice. Pool. So great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We cover our pools in New York. Well, we don't jump into them, but you know what? Yeah, That's no, not I a bad idea. Own. Yeah. It's not a bad it's idea. So good for you. You, you gotta try it. <laughs> well. So the uh, right. sure and it's oh. funny you say that the water in the, in the West Coast is 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 cold. You know, the well, East Coast is dead. it's really yeah. Cold. In, in Monterey, it's, it's really chilly. Not it's not freezing cold, but you know, it's definitely wetsuit surfing. So, you know, to your question, I did grow up skateboarding a lot. I grew up in the, um, you know, when I got there, you know, this sort of goes into a little bit of a deeper who is Chris kind of thing. Um, you know, moving around all those schools and being the new the new kid in school you know, having to fit in and meet new people and, and make friends. And then just to move a couple of years after that and do it all over again, I think was sort of a, a bit of a traumatic thing as a kid to the point that I developed this like need for acceptance kind of thing. Um, and that's actually what drove me to join the SEAL teams. 9-11 was the catalyst, but after I jo joined, I sort of realized that, you know, taking a deeper look, it, it really was because of this deep desire to be accepted by a group and why not be you know try to be accepted by the most badass group in the world so 
I kind of went for it. And that was my motivation behind not quitting even more so than patriotism. Um, and then the patriotism developed for sure. You know, once I became a SEAL, it was like, wow, I made this and I'm doing this for my country. And this overwhelming sort of rush of patriotism um, sort of came into picture. But originally it was for um, for that sort of need for acceptance, you know, sort of feeling. So. Would, you, would you say that your stepfather was any way in your to join the military? You, okay, sorry, you broke up a little bit. What was the question? So, sorry. Uh, would you say that your stepfather and the fact that he was in the Air Force, was that in any way influential to your desire to go uh, into the military? I know now that it was, but I think back then it was in my so, sort of subconscious mind, the way that he influenced me. Because like you said, I was kind of a punk ass kid. Um, I, I, you know, I got good grades all the way up until like maybe ninth grade. But when I moved to Monterey, I had this need for acceptance. So to fit in, I sort of started hanging out with you know, I had good friends and bad friends, and I and I kind of had you know had both throughout the whole four years of high school. But I definitely towards the latter part of it um, was getting into trouble a little bit. Um, you know, skateboarding around Cannery Row. Uh, you know, we were setting up fake like exhibits to, to like that you would do at a science fair to show like, hey, we're studying like sea urchins or sea lions today, and you know during tour season and get a bunch of tips. And we'd make a couple hundred bucks in like an hour. And then we just close shop and go buy a bunch of snacks and candy and, uh, and, and go, uh, you know, and even towards like 11 to 12th grade, we'd go buy some cannabis and go like hide out in the little uh, train. You know, there's like a little caboose on um, display there. And that was like kind of our hideout spot. And, and that, you know, <laughs> it was pretty fun times, but there were a few times where the security guards for the aquarium came out and uh, would shut us down. But so, yeah, I got in a little bit of trouble, but um, it was a good time growing up there. So when did you know or decide that the military was the route you wanted to go? Like, where were you in life when you, you had that oh, realization? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, I detracted there um, for sure. My dad influenced me subconsciously. And now I know that. Um, he was just such a good dude. Um, there's no expectation that I would ever join the military, but once I did, he was super proud of me and our, our relationship, you know, after I became a SEAL was just got infinitely closer and tighter. Now we just have this deeper connection that I never, never thought that we would have when I was growing up. Right. So, um, I just wanted to follow up with that, but, uh, what was the next question? So what, at, at what stage in life did you realize that you were going to go into the military? Was, was it high yeah. school, college? You know, I, I never, I don't really remember thinking about it very much until 9-11 happened. And I realized that I was at this point in my life that I wasn't, I wasn't really happy with what I was doing. I was kind of in and out of community college. I was, you know, working at a bank and I was working at a car dealership. And I, I sort of was like, you know, I have this inner desire to do something more important than this and then 9-11 happened I joined the Navy a couple of years after that because I realized you know I don't know I, I honestly don't remember how that thought got in my, in my head but it's just it's a simple thing I think I do remember some of my friends in high school when we were younger sort of going like there was a time where we were sort of playing soldier and kind of you know, imagining that we, we could be Navy SEALs, right? Because we must have watched a movie or it might've been around the time that that movie um, with Bruce Willis came out, um, Tears of the Sun. You ever seen that? Oh, yeah. sure. Sure, sure. Yeah. Hold on a minute. You joined the Navy after Tears of the Sun came out? I, I can't remember what year that movie was, but I that's just in my mind. I don't remember if it was... Um, yeah, we got to look this up. That was a great film. I'm, I'm looking yeah. it up. I'm looking yeah, it up. Yeah, yeah. What year was that, was that movie out? Because it could have been a different 2003. 2003. Yeah. So um, that was around the time I joined the Navy. So that might have been part of it. But there was some other influence, some other movie. I don't think it was the original Navy SEALs movie with Charlie Sheen. But it was something, <laughs> it was something that caused us to, for about a year, we were running around, you know, on the beach and, like, you know, acting like we were Navy SEALs. So... Once 9-11 happened, it was in my head. I was like, hey, I never thought about the military, but I do want to do something cool. And I just kind of went for it. And that's that's the way it's been for other things in my life, too. I kind of just have an idea and I go for them. And 
most of the time it ends up working out. So you, you when you decided to go in post 9-11, um, your focus from minute one was to become a Navy SEAL. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, 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 which was weird because there's so many, and I'm, I'm actually facing it now with getting this business going with the ice cream. It's just like a almost a daily doubt from other people, right? You, dealing with self-doubt is one thing, but it's just hilarious because every step of the way, it's like, here's my plan. And you have a bunch of people around you that are kind of like, no, that's, it's not going to, it's not going to work that way. Trust me, you know? Don't listen and, to the haters. Dude, they're not even haters per se, but they just take their own experience and just and just underestimate you at all. Yeah, they're Every haters. They get, right? And I know that's based on the majority of people that they've seen, but that's the experience that I've had in my life since joining the Navy, really, is yeah. like, oh, you're going to, first of all, you're going to join the Navy. You're not the kind of dude that, you're not even like, you know, like sort of like physically in shape enough to get through boot camp, you know? not and those people not knowing that i'm like i'm going to i'm going to seal school you know i'm going to be i'm not going through boot camp I'm going to and so it was just like uh the same sort of picture is like even then you go into the recruiter shop and they're like you want to be a seal? all right well you got to pick one of these jobs too because you're probably not going to make it you're going to have to do one of these jobs so then it's just this it's the same thing with with the business right now where i'm like okay i pretend like i'm listening and i'm like got it i'll take note and then i'm just going to do whatever the fuck i want that you know what like um the words of David Goggins are like ringing in my head right now. You don't know me, son. You yeah. don't know me, son. Right? And it's, yeah, yeah. it's like when he says it, you kind of laugh and it's funny. But when, when you put it in context to what you just said, yeah. there's so much truth and weight to that. You know, it's yeah. like, you don't know me. Like, I appreciate everything yeah. you're telling me. But if you knew me, yeah. you know, I got a plan yeah. and I'm, I'm going to carry through. Yeah. I know 90% or 95% or whatever it is of people fail this thing that I'm trying to do, but I don't care. I'm still going to fucking do it. <laughs> right. No, you're the 10%. Yeah. You're the yeah. 10%. There's also a lot to be said about determination. And the fact of the matter is that you got through your career, I'm guessing, at least yeah. a big part of it is determination. It's up here. So yeah. a lot, a lot, it's the same thing in business and people who try to yeah. shoot you down. Yeah. Thanks. All right. And then you just keep going. Right. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and honestly, through my career, even in the teams, I'm sort of a, I don't want to say like careless, but a little bit of a loose planner. You know what I mean? Like I get the gist of the mission and the, and what we need to do. And then the little small details, it's just, I was not one of those guys that was, was really great at memorizing all of that shit. You know, it was more of like a big picture. Like, what do we need to do at each step? And then what are we going to do if something goes wrong kind of thing? Yeah. But with my personality and I think the way that I even sound when I talk is almost like a, it comes off as like a little bit of careless or something, um, but it really isn't. And um, if you go back to the, the beginning of my career, like I've gotten through all of the, I was never the top guy, like the most, like the best, most badass dude, but I was never, I was sort of in the middle performance wise for everything but everything always worked out <laughs> like every firefight, every mission, you know what I mean? Um, every school I went to um, buds, seal team six sniper school, all those, the, the tandem bundle course, which is one of the hardest courses in the military. Yeah. Um, yeah. I got through, I squeaked by that one, but my point is that I got through all of those, the first try with just the way that I operate. And so um, it's even applying to my life now where people are like, you need to get more organized. You need to do this and you do that. You need to whatever. And, uh, yeah, I get those things, but at the same time, I'm going to keep, keep doing what I always do. And it always works out. All right. So, so going into, into the seals or buds, I mean, how much information did you have before you got to buds regarding the pipeline seals in general? I definitely had, I, I had, zero information um technical wise like i didn't read any books tears of the sun is the only movie that was really in my mind i never even i didn't even watch the the original navy seals movie um you know i haven't seen the original navy seals movie all the way through to this day i just i just realized that which is that's going to blow a lot of people's minds like, what the that's you know you don't even have to be a seal to have to be like you should watch that movie right no the, the question is if you didn't watch that movie how the, how the fuck did you even know about the seals because we just we just it was just in my mind it was like i, I want to do something and this is the only thing i've ever heard about at all and so um 
I want to go to special forces. So of course I learned all those things over time. Um, the, the book called warrior elite is one that I did pick up before buds. Um, but I, as I started to read through it, Oh, you know what? That documentary, uh, on the discovery channel about buds class, it was like two thirty four or somewhere. Yeah, around there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw some of that, um, as I was going through, so I was in boot camp. You can't, you, there's no TV or anything there, but in that in between where I was in a training school for, for my rating that I would go to, if I failed out of the seal program, I had about eight weeks to, you know, to try to figure out what buds was going to be about. So I was pretty busy training though. We were waking up, you know, the guys that were in the program, there's about eight of us were waking up at four in the morning. Um, none of those guys made it by the way. <laughs> um, we were going to four in the morning doing our workouts and then doing all of our regular school stuff, marching over to class and all of that. But afterwards I was thinking about, uh, you know, I started watching that documentary, but I kind of stopped myself and I was reading the warrior elite. I kind of got to the pictures and stuff. Um, I kind of skimmed through that book all the way through, but I didn't keep it with me because I intentionally did not want to anticipate what was coming up. Uh, and stress out about it. I kind of wanted to take it day by day in which if I could go back and, and advise anybody, I would say that that method worked really awesome for me because I had zero expectation for what was coming next. And it was almost just like day by day mindfulness of what I needed to do. And sometimes it was scary as fuck because it was like, what do we got to do today? You know, got to swim underwater 50 meters and hold, on one breath hold, you know, and I had an idea about that, but um, I didn't practice that. Um, because whether you practice it or not, there's certain drills like that that are going to bring you to um, the brink of drowning. It doesn't matter how much you practice, and they do it on purpose because everybody needs to feel that struggle. You know what I mean? Um, so that's where the parameters are decided. It's like it doesn't matter if you can if you're a free diver or you've never practiced this. They're gonna you're gonna reach a point where you have to feel this like I need air or I'm gonna die feeling, and if you commit past that feeling, you're gonna make it right you're going to pass the, the, the test so that's just an example but um yeah to your point i didn't uh i didn't prepare much as far as information on the seal program or buds or any of that stuff i had no idea what seal team six was at that time you, you didn't uh, do any like practice training or anything. a lot a lot of these guys like um uh, marcus luttrell he writes in his books about how there was a guy <laughs> in his area who just trained a lot of of people and it, it didn't matter if it was the seals or rangers or whatever the you know elite units obviously very difficult to get in and this guy would train people up you know like an iron man type of training or yeah whatever. You didn't do anything like that just went in cold no well the program forces you to do that so you know i didn't uh, you know the only thing i got I, I trained in before ever joining the navy was i like i i knew what that test was you know it was, you know, it's like you had to run um, a mile and a half. Oh, okay. Like super, like in 10 minutes or 10 minutes and 30 seconds, something like that. Um, you know, I, I can't even remember, but it's like 70 or 80 push ups, sit ups, you know, 15 pull ups or something like that. I, I honestly can't remember what it is because we had to do another one for selection in a dev group, which is the numbers are, are higher. Um, so it's somewhere around, around those numbers, but. All I did was run, do a lot of do push ups, sit ups, and pull ups. Is like, yeah, just dead hang day all day, you know? And so I, I, and then when I got into the program, they make you, they're making you do those things anyways as sort of a prep. So there's a program at boot camp that has you doing those things and swimming a lot. Um, so I honestly didn't even really get good at the combat side stroke, which is, which is what you need to learn until I got in boot camp. Um, I just swam different types of strokes and I tried doing that stroke, but I never tested myself because honestly, I was too afraid. I was like, not even going to be close to it. So I kind of just got to boot camp. I failed the test the first time by about 30 seconds because of the swim, everything else, I crushed it. Um, and I had about two weeks to get better. Um, and they had some, some coaches there that could help you get better. And then I, I just, I, I, I barely passed the test by maybe a few seconds, um, you know, and I was puking on the side of the pool. So um, I knew that when I got to buds uh, that swimming was going to be the hardest thing for me. And it for, definitely was so.
Yeah, I think I think the consensus is water comp is is the hardest for the majority of of people going through uh, the seal pipeline and buds in particular. It, it definitely was the whole second phase of everything was the hard, was for for sure the hardest in my opinion, harder than the third phase, which is more you start shooting a lot, start doing a lot of navigation, land warfare type stuff. First phase is all selection, you know what I mean? Like got to get through hell week and right. prove that you're not going to quit and all the diving underwater, feeling like you're going to drown every single day, you know, type stuff happens in second phase and it sucks. But um, yeah, I didn't prep outside of what the programs provided in, in coaching and, and just like self workouts. I didn't, I didn't prep much um, other than that. I didn't do a lot of strength training you know, my opinion about those guys that train guys up to prep them for special forces type stuff. I think that if you happen to be a guy that's going to make it mentally already, you know what I mean? It's almost like the universe is a given for those. For right. Like the, there's only these, these dudes are going to make it regardless if they prep for it or not. If they go to those prep programs, it's only going to be easier for them. You know, like they're going to crush it. Right. Cause they're already meant to pass. Uh, and then the guys that aren't meant to pass, it doesn't matter if they prepare or not, they're not going to get through. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so the GWAT was already, you know, it had already kicked off, right. When you get to buds, right. Did you have like, were yeah. any of your instructors, people that had already been overseas, um, either in Iraq or Afghanistan? Yeah, they're, yeah. Most of my instructors were like, seemed like second platoon type guys um second or third maybe and that that was like a common time frame for guys to go be buds instructors and it was like you do probably two platoons before they they they're like hey we need guys to to go over to buds and be instructors or something like that um so yeah a lot of them had been back from deployments from Iraq and Afghanistan that was right. 2000 that was 2004 by the time I was in buds so it was already um uh, you know couple of years past 9-11 all right and do you did that like set the tone for sort of like the instruction in the class that did it it impact the way that they transferred information to you guys yeah. And the way they yeah definitely i i'm very grateful for the timing of my class because i wasn't you know we weren't the 2001 2002 class of guys that were being instructed by dudes who had not really had much combat experience per se right and that's where it's back to now i think is you got most buds instructors most seal team six guys too not the instructors all the all the dev group guys that are really experienced but you're starting to get a lot of team guys even at dev group that have don't have any combat experience and that's there's nothing wrong with that it's just it's just that's where Different. we're at so it's almost like the cycle started again back to you know what it was like must have been like in 2000 or something it was like uh, yeah, there were some hostage or some there were some operations that happened, but there wasn't a continuous, you know, cycle of deployments and, and combat. So uh, I'm very grateful for that. All of my buds instructors were experienced guys. Um, they had um, a lot of. They must have just come back from deployment and and, and tr start transferring that knowledge to us immediately. You know, so I got the benefit of that for sure. That's the best what, kind. Class, what class were you, by the way? Sorry. 254, winter, winter hell week. Ugh. That sucks. <laughs> it's right, so it's all no funny. warm and sunny beat this selections. Beat the harder it was, the, the happier, the, 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 sure. the more proud you feel. It was like, yeah, mine was really hard, so it's all good. Same thing with my my um dev group um green team class. Like we had a really we were the last class to to have to swim across the Mississippi river and back. Um, and that, and like, and that's a seven, it's like seven miles to the river you, or three and a half miles to the river. You swim across the thing, you know, you get washed way down shore, have to run back up and then cross it back again. It was insane. So it was so unsafe. They had to stop doing it. <laughs> It, it feels Not, good now, but it didn't feel good when you were doing it. But now it. I'm like, yeah, I'm so happy we did that fucking swim. Right. You're, you're, you're a legacy now. Legacy class. 254, you know, yeah, last yeah. to do the Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So uh, any scary moments uh, for you in training up? Uh, not, not like safety-wise. Um, 
training up and you're talking about like seal team like team level or train or like bus in the or training like, in the in the pipeline to get before you get assigned to a team yeah no not really any that's just scary like in general but um mm -hmm. just because you know you're not yet so comfortable with with um you know it's i'd say buds was 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 more like that once you get the qualification training you've kind of you've gotten through all of that kind of scary shitty feeling type stuff you've already proved that you're not gonna you're not gonna quit when it you know so i'd say no i think it was it was pretty it was kind of cruise control through the qualification training phase part you're just learning skills and your job is to just learn 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 um stay out of trouble and then get to your team all right and and once you pass through all of selection did you automatically get assigned to an east coast team no, uh, my class, we um, sort of, we didn't have the option, but it was like, hey, if you prefer one coast or the other, you can say so, and then we'll try to organize the orders that way. I actually wanted, um, I was kind of agnostic. I was like, if I get San Diego, that's fine. I'm a California guy anyways. Uh, but if I get Virginia, I've never been over to the East Coast. Um, you know, that'd be cool to, you know, I, I did when I was a kid a little bit, but, you know, it'd be cool to, um live on the East coast. And then I thought about it more and was like, if I make a career out of this, because my original intention was if I make this, I'm going to retire. Um, it might be a little easier, you know, to afford a decent house and, you know, build a family over there and sort of, um, you know, then I started hearing about dev group and I was like, you know, I had a couple guys mention like, Hey, who, anybody going to dev group or wants to, you know, it's a lot easier if you're already over there than if you have to ship over or, um, sort of live in the barracks from, from San Diego. So, you know, and then I got orders to San Diego and there was another guy in my class who um, really wanted to stay in, in San Diego. And so we swapped orders and I came out to Virginia. So. Yeah. So what was your first team assignment? Still team 10. It was 10. Okay. Um, and what was, uh, what was your MOS uh, when you, you finished with selection? Back then, it was op operations specialist, which was sort of a radar slash navigational type dude on a ship. You know, all my schooling had to do with like dead reckoning and, you know, charting and, and all that kind of stuff. All, all of which I never ended up doing. But uh, and that was before, you know, I had to take, I think, two, I think my E5 or E6 exam was an operations specialist exam. And like, I had to study all the shit that I don't, that I didn't do because I was in the SEAL teams. And that's what it used to be like. It was like, hey, you're a SEAL with a rating. You're, you're like, a, you know, a gunner's mate or a fucking whatever. And you have to study for that just to pass the, so it, it was a smart move. They changed that. So now the SEALs have their own rating and you can actually test out to SEAL knowledge, you know? Right. Uh, so I was happy when that happened. All right. So you, you get assigned to 10, you show up at 10. And how bad is the hazing when you yeah, get to your bad. first <laughs> team? <laughs> um, back then it was, I have to say, I don't know how it is now, honestly, in the, in the SEAL teams. Um, at Dev Group, it's, it's really like big boy rules. It, like guys are a little more mature in their, in their career path. So it's not, it's not something that's common there. But in the SEAL team, it's like everybody's between the ages of like 18 and 20 or whatever. And, you know... I have to say that uh, it's probably not that bad initiation wise. Like you got to perform through the train up phase. You got to, you got to fit in, you know what I mean? And for me, it sucked because I got in trouble immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go spill the beans. Yeah. <laughs> like captain's mass trouble immediately. So um, all of that sort of like getting in trouble stuff stayed with me. Right. And um, I have to say now that it for sure was an ego thing. Like I, I had this, like, and now I made it as a seal. Now I'm going to actually like, you know, I got to fit in and I, and I want to be, so, you know, I want to be cool around these guys. And I want, you know, so um, the first trip we did at team 10 was a diving trip and it was a combo between diving and jumping. So uh, the trip was in Key West, but we stopped in Destin, Florida to do some training Uh we went like we went out it was like literally checked in a seal team 10 maybe get got settled got all my gear issued all that kind of stuff and maybe like three weeks or four weeks later we're on our way to destin florida train 
and do some jumping. So we're doing some jumping. Uh, you know, my group of new guys was awesome. I had like six or seven new guys and we went around everywhere together and, and we really melded well. We had like, that was, that platoon was, was badass. Like I have to say, um, when we get further and talk about the deployment, it was the most intense deployment in Iraq that it, like my most intense deployment that I've had like in my whole career, right. There's some crazy shit happened and it was, it was an awesome, but crazy, um, deployment, but so we're in Destin, Florida, jumping. We go out to a bar and, you know, we're drinking. Uh, a guy in the bar takes up an issue with me, probably because I was being obnoxious. And uh, they plan on like sucker punching me out in the parking lot afterwards. And so me and this guy are going back and forth in the bar, just, you know, messing around. Um, they they decide to take it to another level, probably not realizing that like my whole team is in there hanging out, right, of SEALs. And so we get out to the parking lot and this and the, that same dude like walks by and he just starts looking menacing like he's gonna sucker punch me and then he he does like he and one of my other new guy buddies saw this happening and basically stepped in and like just clocked this guy as he was going to sucker punch me so he gets knocked out the cops get called we all get in trouble go back to the barracks and platoon chief which is one of the best guys ever in the um one of the best seals of all time uh, was my just happened to be my platoon chief at the time. Now he's a master chief, and uh, is like, "Hey, tell me what happened." Basically, I kind of allowed my buddy to take the fall for that incident, and in my drunken stupor, I didn't do a good enough job of of announcing that it was like that it was my fault, right? So already started on a on a bad foot. Like everybody in the platoon was like this little shit, you know. And so we move on. We're like, hey, you guys are on notice now. So any more stuff and 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 you're screwed. We're taking we're taking your birds away, right? So um if you did if you did fuck up enough, uh you could lose your trident and and basically you're done. You're you're just in the regular navy, right? So um, but then again, over the course of the history of the SEAL teams, there's also been lots of guys getting in trouble and, and some of it's detrimental and some of it's innocent trouble. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. SEAL, team, SEAL team stuff. So uh, we move on to Key West, Florida and I'm out with another new guy <laughs> and, you know, we're hanging out with these girls. There's these other guys that want to hang out with the girls. It ends up at the end of the night. We're jumping in a cab with them. They invite us back and these dudes come out and they try to pull us out of the cab. We get into a big fight. Um, <laughs> Uh, the cops come and me and my buddy, he's not my buddy anymore. He actually ended up quitting because the hazing was so bad. So we get wrapped up by the cops. She sets us aside on one side of the sidewalk and then goes to talk to the girls. And they're like, they're like, Hey, no, these guys are not at fault. It's these guys that are the assholes, the other guys. Right. So they're going to let us go. But my friend was like, hey, we can't afford to get in trouble again. We're going to get our birds pulled, so we need to run and, like, hit the water, swim around the bay, over to the barracks, and then just go sleep. So, of course, I was a, you know, stupid young team guy was like, that sounds like a good idea. So we go one, two, three, run, and we spend the next 45 minutes, like, running through Key West and just, like, cops falling over fences and chasing. It was a big shit show. Um, they finally grab us up, and we, we spend the night in jail. My platoon chief comes back in. He he bails us out, but at the same time, he's like, uh, yeah, I know all these guys, so you guys are going to pay for this, right? He's like, I, I should take your birds, but I'm not going to for now because I want to see something. Um, we hadn't even given it a chance to prove ourselves on the team yet. You know oh. what I mean? So it was pretty fucking miserable. So we go back. The rest of the trip, I'm getting hazed every day, and I don't even think I can get to, to the details of what – what like what kind of stuff happened on this podcast but, you know that would come back um yeah we'll talk offline yeah, that'll be yeah, offline. We'll talk offline give you those details it's it's, yeah. it's crazy but i got through it um and honestly i have to wait say wait that, wait chris one sec one question though yeah, Did yeah any of it i mean any of it involve ice cream no it, it involved uh, key lime <laughs> pie key lime pie because we were in key West. okay Okay. <laughs> I got one question. When the cops caught you, was this before or after Sears school? Um, 
after after. Oh, that's disappointing. I've been to two Sears schools. I had to go to the JSOC one too, but it was after. How many cops family. did you have after you? Oh my god, it was the whole department. <laughs> so, the whole Key West department. Everybody. Oh, it was a whole department. So this is the OJ chase, basically. Oh, that's so that that's all right. You know what? That's forgivable then. Okay. For a few years, there was a rule that the guys, anyone like any of the teams that came there to train, could not go out in Key West and, and drink. <laughs> so, like people hated me for a while. You ruined it for everybody. Especially my team. They were like, we're grown ass men and we can't go out this whole trip because of you guys. So you're, you know, so we, we felt that, that pain in return. So, uh, but needless to say, we went through captain's mask when we got back. The other guy, he quit. He get, he turned his bird in. He couldn't um, get through, get through it. So I went through the mask, you know, on my own. Um, but I have to say that set the precedence for the rest of my career being, being successful in my mind um because i had to spend that next year and a half just totally like shutting the fuck up and 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 performing um even more so than all of the other new guys because now i had to prove myself right i couldn't just get by with the with the standard or even a little above standard i had to like i had to bust my ass so um, I got through all sort of the hazing. The next trip we went on was a land warfare trip in Arkansas. And that's when I really started crushing it. Um, and I was still getting hazed at night in, during those, those trips. Right. So we're done with training. We're tired. We're doing night evolutions. And I'm just, I'm just when every night that I go to sleep, it's at the point where I'm like, they're either going to grab me tonight and we're going to go through some, some hazing stuff, or they're going to leave me alone tonight and I'll get some sleep and hopefully do all right tomorrow. And that, that was a, I have to say, if you're talking about scary feelings, that was the that was more scary than anything that happened in second phase or buds or even in some combat. You know what I mean? Because yeah, that's POW like, scary. That's like, what the yeah, fuck are they going like, to do to me now? You're getting <laughs> snatched out of bed, you know, in the middle of the night, and you don't by know, your friends, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 and and um, and it's just up to their imagination on what they want to do to you. You know what I mean? So right, right. Um, There's that nobody was a tough who's. <laughs> But fast forward through it, I got, uh, I really performed well through the whole thing. I became a JTAC. I went to sniper school, a new guy. Um, and we went on that deployment and I just, um, I got some really, really good JTAC and rooftop sniper experience. Um, and really, um, I got a couple bronze stars out of that deployment. And I think that my next rotation was like, I didn't have anything to worry about after that. I, I was accepted. So I had like reached a whole level of acceptance at that team and with those guys that I could ever have dreamed of and I don't think that it could have happened to that level if I didn't have if I didn't get in that trouble and then have to go recover through that struggle and and, and prove myself like if I just was like a guy who was just kind of even killed and got through it all with, without all of that um I, I still would have been okay but I think there was just a different level because I had to um I just had to compensate for that that initial uh, fuck up as a new guy. Right. Yeah, so once you're you, under the you microscope went... and you can't squeak by anymore. Now you actually right. have to do everything. And yeah, well, yeah, well, was, yeah. It being under out. the microscope for for that long. Yeah. It, and that's honestly, I think, why I also got through um, green team like dev group selection. Um, I was still in the middle performance wise, but it was like I was okay with that feeling of like, there's nothing you can't hide anything. You know what I mean? Right. And, and just so everybody understands being in the middle of, of green team, right. right. Is, is, you know, like next level everywhere else, you know, yeah. green team is the, the epitome. It's like the, the pinnacle of the Navy seal trajectory and career. Right. Yeah. But even in that, it's like a combine for the NFL or something. They're the top guys, middle guys, and like Tom, Gr Tom, Tom Brady sucked, but he's the, he's the goat, you know what I mean? Cause right. he's, he sucked at the combine, but his vision, right? And so there's just some guys like that that were top of the class. DJ, one of those guys, you know, just off the top of my head. Um, but it, it honestly, it, it it matters, but it doesn't matter because you know there's infinite experiences that happen, right? And and infinite ways to be tested as an operator and what you're good at and what you get can get better at and what you're not great at. Um, so it's super subjective, but. Um, in my personal experience, I'm, I'm grateful for everything that happened, include, including getting in trouble right off the bat in Key West, Florida. 
um, because everything was a lesson learned, you know? Yeah, I mean, it shaped the trajectory of your career thereafter, right? I mean, maybe, yeah, who knows if you would have even gone to green team, right? Who knows if you would have tried out? Absolutely. Yeah, it might not have. Right. All right. So question, did, did you go to, you, you went to sniper school before your first deployment? Uh, no, I went, uh, I'm trying to remember back, back to that. Yeah. Yeah. I think like right before we did. So, um, yeah, like right before deploys, one of my last schools on that, on that, um, cycle. All right. So outside of JTAC and sniper school, did you go to any other specialty schools? Those were my main two, and then there's other little ones that most guys get, like dive, diving supervisor type type um, cast master, like where you're um, learning how to cast fast ropes and you know, all that kind of stuff. So those are all just normal ones, but um, the major ones were were JTAC and sniper. Yeah. All right, and, and first deployment was to Iraq. Correct. All right, you you want to talk at all about any deployments? Yeah, it's up well, to Mike, you. Uh, we were in something called task force 17 which was a tier one task force but they were allowing like they needed more um towards the mission so they were allowing certain teams to to sort of attach to that task force so it was it was incredible we were a white side seal team that got to use uh jsoc assets that were there little birds and 60s and, and all this kind of stuff and then of course we had our own ground assault package with humvees which we were using almost exclusively at for the first couple of months until we rolled over an IED in Sadr City. So Sadr City was just one of the most dangerous places of all time in Iraq. Um, and we were going in and out of there every night after, after bad guys. And uh, I, the, I feel like the vibe of our task force was like, we were so efficient at capturing and killing guys um, in that arena that we sort of developed a little bit of an ego towards it. Like, you know, they're missing us with IEDs here and there, right? Because we had super good navigators and drivers, right? And we had full confidence in each other. Um, but, you know, we had a bad uh, incident one night where we uh, got a flat tire on one of the Humvees and we had to sort of slow roll out of there. And it was just a really terrible spot where there were just IEDs all over the place. And um, our third vehicle got hit by... Uh, an EFP, an explosively formed penetrator, sort of copper shape charge yeah. IED. So the explosion went off and, you know, we had heard close explosions before and it was almost like a feeling of, and I was the JTAC at the time. So I was controlling all the air sats from, from inside the Humvee. Um, and it was like, Hey, yeah, you guys just had another one hit, but looks like none of the vehicles are damaged, but um, you know, so there would, it wasn't like the image, the image of an IED that you imagine. Right. Like, it didn't, it didn't explode the vehicle. It, went, everything. it, it was just it. like, you know, copper plasma fragments blasted yeah. through. The that Humvee. defeats the armor, right? Absolutely defeats the armor. And to us, it just looked like Swiss cheese, you know? Yeah. It goes right through. Yeah. So the vehicle's still rolling, but then uh, pretty quickly after that, our platoon chief realized what it was and was like, Hey, you know, vehicle three is hit. We've got, got everybody in the back of that truck was was dead incinerated yeah yeah well they weren't incinerated they just had holes through them oh you know? yeah so um three three guys got killed including jason lewis and so they named camp lewis after him after after that incident but um uh, one was a combat camera guy another was a uh sort of a uh, technical operator like um uh, um you know, like technical support comms type mm -hmm. type thing. And so uh, we learned a huge lesson that night. We ended up staying overnight at a Marine FOB within Sodder City, um, you know, fighting back guys, planting IEDs around us because they knew we we're going to be driving out the next day, um, RPGs and uh, small arms fire and all that kind of stuff. So we kind of like held it down there, got our snipers on the roof, um, kind of processed what had just happened. I was the JTAC, so I performed a medevac uh, sort of operation with, um, this is kind of crazy because at the airfield where um, in in, uh, in like Baghdad airfield, we are, our med medical uh, like medevac helos were, would fly from there 
in case of a contingency, and it would be like from where we were at about a 20 minute flight. So a total of 40 minutes plus add the medevac time, you know, possibly over an hour before somebody's wow. getting treated at the, at the hospital. So we launched that medevac immediately when we got to the FOB, once we kind of laid the guys out and figured out exactly what was going on while the rest of the team was sort of containing the, the, the operating base and, and battling it out with guys, you know, on the outside of the, the, um, the barriers. This is a very small, when I say base, it's like talking about maybe 40 Marines total, um, just surrounded by HESCO barriers and sort of like living in this little, this little operating base, right? So I got with the platoon chief and said, hey, you know, chief, we've got two Apaches flying around right now. We're going to wait. This could be, here's the timing of, 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 so because we had two guys were for sure already dead, but one guy was still, was still uh, getting by. He had a couple fragments, but his face was sort of like unrecognizable, but you could see that he was still breathing. So we we're trying to keep him alive, bent over. He was the combat cameraman. And since that was the case, and then we also had one guy that was the driver of my vehicle who had a golf ball sized piece of copper lodged in his leg that was had carterized an artery. Um, but we had no idea what was going on there and we didn't want him to lose a leg, right? So he was the fourth priority, but um, really became the second priority because, you know, he, we had two guys dead and then one still um alive and then him, himself right and so i i suggested you know i first called the helos and said hey guys i don't know if this is even doable but what do you think about this because apaches are two-seaters right you got two two guys flying uh, they're all guns right so i said hey you know i had seen in a in a demo when we were training for, with them that one guy could ride on the wing right yeah. if he wanted to yes lanyard in so i said hey what's the possibility that you guys uh that one of you guys um because there's no way that the that the combat camera guy could go on the apache because he had to lay down he couldn't just like sit you know what i mean so we had to wait for the medevac to get to get him and the other two guys that were already um deceased so my focus was on what can we do while we're waiting you know what i mean so i asked i said hey can can the passenger seat pilot uh, or whatever you guys decide get out on the wing and we load this guy that could lose his leg into the passenger side or into one of the, one of the seats and you guys medevac him, right? They were like, that's a great idea. Hold on. And they hit up their command and they like went through SATCOM to ask permission from their commander, which in the answer came back as a no. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> so they said, no, we can't do that. And then, you know, they're flying around a little bit. We're waiting and they kind of get back to me and the pilot says, Hey, I'm going to go, I want to do, I'm going to do it. Right. So he disobeys basically that order. And, and is like, Hey, we'll, we'll talk to them about why we decided to do this on the way there, but let's get him going. So he doesn't lose his leg or die. Right. So they, they, they throw him on there. So like we landed Apache in the middle of this fob while the other one is, you know, sort of backing him up. And there's still firefight shit going on, right? We get that guy onto the Apache in the in the seat. The other and the pilot is is on the wing with his lanyard hooked in, and they fly back. And he's in the hospital in like ten minutes because they're they're fast, right? Yep. Um, and he's getting treated for that leg, and they save his leg. So it ended up getting amputated months months later, like almost twelve months later, because they were going back and forth with trying to reconnect the nerves and do different sorts of stem cells and special treatments but all in all it's sort of degraded and you know he decided himself like hey i'm tired of dealing with this shit chop it off so so they did and it was a below the knee amputation which is much better than Get a, a prosthetic level. yeah yeah so he has a prosthetic now right. and he actually continued to operate in the team for several years after that until he retired wow. so he's up you get one of those now. blades you get a blade prosthetic uh i'm not sure which i've seen these guys sure. jump out of helicopters with the blade prosthetic and run oh and, yeah i mean are, unbelievable oh guys so. race with those and everything yeah. so mm -hmm. yeah i don't know what kind of bionic legs he got but i'm sure he got some cool stuff yeah um 
you know, we drank out of it a few times and, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. And we like beat people up with his leg or whatever. like a pirate. <laughs> yeah. Peg leg. We, had fun, we had fun with it, but, uh, he, he's retired up in Maine now living his life. And he was just one of the most amazing mentors I've ever had in teams. Um, super knowledgeable and, uh, was a great guy, but anyways, so what happened was that helo pilot got reprimanded right after that mission and fired and like whatever else happened through his command but as we went through our awards writing and our different processing of that operation and all the sort of after stuff that happens when when bad things happen or good things or, or you know um he ended up getting a silver star for that decision instead wow yeah i would think so yeah yeah um, wow so, I don't remember what the question was, but that is probably the most prolific uh, thing that happened during my Iraq deployment. We had several other big firefights. Our turnover op was still team two coming in, which is where basically the incoming team goes out with you on a combined mission to go like, Hey, we're going to this target. We kind of choose one that like, you know, there may break in the break in, in Iraq at that time. There could always be a firefight. We're like, right. Hey, this one might be a little benign where we can actually go through the process of prosecuting a target, doing SSE, mm -hmm. all this you know the JTAC can figure out the stack right and, and and everybody can sort of like uh like work together and and sort of turn over like here this is what this is what we got going on here you know what i mean and you guys are now after this op you guys got it and we're out of here it's a real op but it's a training op at the same time absolutely yeah, yeah. like that um, mm -hmm. so and we all did that we did that we did that when we came in too it was really beneficial to see the environment with the guys that have been operating there for like seven months. You know what I mean? Um, but what happened was that we were walking through a field and we got uh, shot by some snipe, like a sniper in um, just out in the open before we got to the town. One of the SEAL team two guys got shot through the chest. So it was another medevac scenario um, where in another SEAL who's now in gold squadron, who's one of my, he's one of my best friends. He was the best man at my wedding was the corpsman who took care of that guy. Um, I think he got a bronze star for that, that mission, but he, um, that was another sort of prolific operation that happened. And we ended up pulling off the target and it was a big JTAC exercise where I was just basically Winchester and AC-130, which means that, you know, used up all their ammo, mm -hmm. um, had another medevac scenario going on. And that was the turnover op. It was like, hey, oh, sorry guys, we, we thought this was going to be, like pretty chill and uh but you got a good turnover op <laughs> it's like yeah that's the kind of shit that happens like every other day so um it was it was uh it was crazy man it was a wild deployment and awesome wow but he survived he didn't he didn't get killed he survived he's still in the teams now to this day it, uh, just like a clean shot through his shoulder and um he's he's good to go but it was just uh that was a that was a wild deployment <laughs> Right. So, and uh, how many deployments overall did you have before Green Team even popped up on your radar screen? Well, I had three before Green Team. Okay. And uh, but, how but does the third one was? I had two like legit SEAL Team Ten deployments, but my third one was I augmented Red Squadron before ever going to Green Team. That's kind of what gave me some insight to those guys and and um, you know the guy who I was working for, basically. Um, gave me the inspiration to to try out to try and try to get there. Um, and during any of your deployments, either before or after you got to, to Team Six, did you cross paths with any of the guys that that are out there that Amos. everybody knows? Right. Yeah. Like <laughs> uh, I'm trying to think of some of their names, but uh... <laughs> <laughs> if you got to think, you mean like in my in like what do you mean by? Um cross paths like just like on deployment did you yeah, like work with them Jocko right. or yeah. um, no so Jocko's west coast team we mm -hmm. had different areas of operation so I didn't really um integrate or have any have much experience with any of the west coast guys um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for sure I crossed paths with west coast guys and dev group guys Rob O'Neill and um some of those other guys Eddie Penny like like we're all worked at the same team and, and cross each other on deployments and in, in uh, the locker room and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm trying to think of any other like sort of big name dudes out there doing cool shit. Um, yeah. Like not, not, not really. 
it's right. a small community, but but also we're all, all on different schedules and like sure. You know, one team rotates in while the other rotates out. And even when we're stateside, one team's training somewhere while the other's on their sort of standby home cycle. And so, um, you know, not too much. All right. So, so green team, what, what's the impetus? Like how, how do you get motivated or inspired to try out for green team? I did that augment in uh, JBAT Afghanistan. And, you know, I was a JTAC there too. So I got, a, had a lot of really good experience with them. Um, funny story, they use CCTs as their JTACs, right? So one of their CCTs was having um, issues with, you know, all of the ups and downs of the elevation change of the mountains and, and sort of like actually just getting to the target, which, but it was really fucking hard back then. Sometimes you're climbing mountains and you're, you know, walking eight to 10, even more kilometers sometimes just to get there much less do the target and, and then leave so but he also had some personal stuff going on whatever but um so the task force brought me over because i was with i was i was at an outstation which is just a couple of seals not not a whole task force um and i was augmenting for both um the squadron and um the uh agency para, paramilitary guys ground branch uh, supporting with our with our assets so they pulled me over and I got a lot of good work out of that and then it sort of motivated me they, I had a, a few guys sort of go like hey man you're you're a good dude you should try to come over and get into selection and so whenever that happens it, it's for sure a good thing because they they have your name now they've seen you operate um, you know like hey this is a good dude so you kind of have this like you don't have to break through that layer of of trust, I guess, toward yeah, like street cred. Are, are these guys. Yeah. Street cred, a little bit of street cred. Yeah. So that for sure helped. And, uh, you know, I put my package in, you, you go through sort of like a initial psych psychological and the physical test screener, you pass that stuff. And then like a year or a cycle later, you're in your green team, your selection starts. And so that's, I went through that process. And then after I finished my, uh, deployments at team 10, or I got back when the, the next training cycle started, I was training up, getting my body ready. Cause there's a lot of, uh, we did a lot of um, physical training to get ready for that. Cause green team's no joke. Um, honestly, in my opinion, I don't know, everyone probably has different ones, but in different ways, uh, green team was harder than buds in my opinion. Um, as far as like chances of getting through uh, difficulty of it overall, Buds was a lot harder physically, um, but in my mind, that's in a way not so not so difficult because it's like as long as you're not going to quit, and you know you're not going to die, you can get through it. It's just a physical test, right? With some basic learning type performance shit, you know, learning weapons and all that navigation and diving, all these kind of things. But green team is like a mental mind fuck for like nine months straight every day. Right, and you're competing against other experienced seals, for other experienced seals, and just the the pressure of it, the daily pressure of it, um, was just was just much more difficult for me. Like it's a, there's no time to sort of like relax your mind. You always have to be ready for the next thing. Where it's like, okay, these were the rules we told you today. These are the things that change for the next day, and you got to go and do all that without fucking up at all. You know. Or at least not making the same mistake three times, you know, because you can make it that you can make certain mistakes once or twice, and then you make it the third time you're out, right? So um, that's just my opinion. But was yeah, it so? Was it was it me. was it a greater emphasis on like skills and tactics? Absolutely. Um, right and and then like the performance the level of excellence is like yeah. so high, and your margin for that's error right. is so low. That's right. right? You know, like trainability really they need to see you know you learn all these sops and you can get good at them you know just like any basketball player or something but what if they say from now on you can't touch the backboard anymore it just has to go straight into the net and go play and win the game and then you go play and you you're like you forget and you do a layup and you're like Meh. they stop the whole game and like you fucked up you know don't do it again or you're out you know <laughs> right Right. So now you're all right. And so you, you get through green team and then 
how does it work? You get immediately assigned to a team and deploy or is there a workup? Yeah, or? as you get towards the end, they start a draft process and it's a combination of, you know, guys in the other in the squadrons voting on who they want and, you know, the cadre, you know, deciding who they want to let go where and uh, there's like a, a little draft process. So they decide who's going to go where by the time green team's fully over. And then you just, you just get there, you go. Got it. Okay. And, and, and what it, guys, there might be guys in the squadron that like, like I augmented for a guy. And if he wanted me there, you'd be like, Hey, we really should get this guy. If nobody else picks him in the first or second round, it really is like rounds of draft picking until everybody's picked. And then there's also a phase of like switching around and you know, like trades and just all this, all this kind of same shit that happens in sports basically. Got it. Now, now because of your JTAC background and experience on deployment, is that your is that like the primary job description that you're going to have when you're assigned to to DevGrew, or is it they put you where they need you? Uh, I they sort of fill the teams as they need you, mm -hmm. and they already know what your specialties are, so you come in already having specialties. And so then at Dev Group, they just those specialties just translate into um, whatever sort of um, specialty you're gonna be in, whether you're a recce team. So that's what I went I went for, right? If you're a breacher, you're gonna end up being you know in the breacher group of guys and eventually become a master breacher for your team. Um, and you keep up with all your skills even if you don't use them there. Like you're if you're a corpsman, you still keep you still stay current even though we're using PJs, which is the which are the tier one you know, medics of the world, um, best in the world, CCTs, but we still, you know, there'll be times where somebody needs to call fires or a medevac and there's no CCT available for whatever reason. And you know, that is up. So has to be done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Got it. All right. And deployments with team six, how many? I did uh five with silver squatter. Wow. Uh, yep. Uh, three in Afghanistan and two in uh, Somalia. And so very grateful for that too. So I'm very, I'm very grateful and very lucky to have had all combat deployments, except for one stint I had to go do in Germany, which was more of a J set sort of uh, training partner force type, type uh, deployment where I was bouncing back and forth to places in, Africa and other stuff to, to train their, uh, to train their guys. Um, we call it, um, FID foreign intelligence defense or something or foreign, foreign internal defense, not intelligence. Right. Right. Um, and so not an enjoyable thing for some people in soft to do, but not really for seals in my opinion. So, uh, but I'm very fortunate that the rest of my deployments were all combat type deployments and and I, I i got what i needed out of it and when i decided to get out i was i was very satisfied with my with my career i wasn't insecure about any experiences or anything like that all right so yeah as as compared to afghanistan that's i mean it's a, it's a very very different as as i understand or oh uh, it's a little different but very similar too it's a lot of rugged terrain out there it's like it's a little different there's some areas down south that are super muddy i mean we've had to do operations where we're just literally you know we've had four mat v's and three of them are stuck and we're like hey we can't get this fourth one stuck and we're screwed right and just recovery operations all night to get these things unstuck because there's just monsoons and and you know and then in the dry season it's the opposite there's it's drought it's just dust everywhere and you know, it's just a really gnarly, it's like, I feel like Africa is like Australia in some ways, like everything, everything wants to kill you, you know, the terrain, the animals, the people. Forget the enemy, <laughs> right. Just being there wants to kill you. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Right. That's the enemy. Um, so yeah, there, there was, we're still, there's still troops going out there right now. It's a, it's a regular deployment for them. They're still combating, you know, massive groups of terrorists that are going on in, in Eastern uh, Africa and Somalia, uh, conducting attack, uh, attacks all over the world. And um, there's some polit politics to it too, as we sort of compete with uh, China on the, on the mining, in, like on the investing of global, yeah. you know, industries, right. Yep. And territory. So 
uh, there's all that stuff going on. And honestly, part of the reason why I got out five years ago and decided I'm just going to do ice cream because I need to be done thinking about all that stuff. I did my part. Well, of the, <laughs> okay. the the bureaucratic and political bullshit. So that let's segue into the ice cream because that's yeah, really so, what I want to hear about. Yeah. OK, so let, let's yeah. let's segue. But yeah, sorry. You know, I had some epic, epic uh, operations in Somalia, you know what I mean, to this day. But uh, um, it just it. Like I said, the feeling when I was when I decided to get out was because of my kids were young. And, and honestly, the decision to get out was because my oldest son would not FaceTime me or talk to me on the phone for five months when I was in Somalia. Because, and he was like three or four, he was four years old because he said, I only want to talk to dad when he's home. So he's like angry at me. And I got off the phone that time and go like, ha that's so cute. And then I just started bawling, like crying my eyes out going like, okay. Like this is part of this, this is what those older guys with kids that are teenagers had to go through to, to stay in the team, right. And retire. And so for me, like I said, part of the reason I'm grateful for all of those deployments um, and all those, all those combat deployments that I did was because at that point I was like, I thought about it when I'm satisfied. I did. I fucking right. did. I did. What I came to do. Like you, I didn't check, you checked all those boxes. Yeah like, yeah. like I realized unlike when I first, got through buds when I was young that I didn't come here to retire in the Navy. I came here to perform, uh, you know, my duty to this country and actually have a direct effect on um, all the shit bags in this world that, that mean us harm. Right. And so I did that and it was an easy decision for me to get out and be here for my, for my family and, and especially my wife and uh, who, who is, she's amazing. She's just the, the best person in the world. So, um, so I got out. So I'm, I'm assuming this wasn't like an overnight decision, right? There was, there was oh. a slow progression to get yeah, to this yeah. point, right? Yeah, there's a process. Because, yeah, I'm, I mean, you're at the, the height of your career. You, you've reached, like I said, you've reached the pinnacle of the career of a Navy SEAL, right? I Green like team, dev grew, SEAL team six, you're now deploying, you're training other people, right? Even if it wasn't the ideal assignment, you're deploying wherever they need you, right? You got the coolest gear, best assignments, right? But now you, you're, you're realizing, I've checked those boxes. My kid needs me, right? More than the world needs me right now. Yeah. So so take us through that, that process if you can, right? Because it, it, it's not easy for vets. It's not easy for people at, yeah. at the tier one, for any, at any level, but mm -hmm. especially at the tier one level where you are, your life is your team. Your life is the mission. Your oh, life absolutely. is is everything that you're doing, right? And to the exclusion of all else, because you, it, the minute you let that in, right, you can potentially put yourself and other people at, at risk, right? Yeah, absolutely, it has to be that mindset. Yep. So, so, so go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, it was for sure a process. It, it was a few weeks because I had like five or six weeks left on that deployment, and I was the team leader of an outstation in northern Somalia. And we had, we still had this big operation to do where we stayed up in the mountain. Um, you know, we, we went up on this mission for like 21, 22 days where we like, um, we had to get through an ambush to get there. We, it was like a village um, that was just swarmed with Al-Shabaab guys that had taken over that village from, from people that lived there for hundreds of years before that or however long. Um, and so we cleared them out of there on this 22 day long mission, just hunting bad guys. It was awesome, but you know, I was still processing my decision as I was going through that as a, as a team leader, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I had a lot of time to think about it in between our missions and, and, and everything, but when we came back down and we had a couple of weeks to pack our stuff up and sort of transfer to the next guys coming in, turn over everything, um, I started really just having to figure out um how i was going to tell the team you know i was supposed to be a team leader within the squadron on the next year which is one of the pinnacles of being a, a team six operator is that reaching that team leader spot you know the next one's a troop chief and then however far you go past that but getting to at least that point is like a big deal for you know the the a, a typical operator there so I was really looking forward to that, but I basically knew I was like, Hey, I had this feeling of like, I'm, I'm about to let them down because I'm up for that next and I'm, and I'm not going to do it. Right. Um, luckily I had a, a freaking badass squadron master chief, um, that 
that already understood that. And so when I told him like, Hey, this might be bad timing for this decision. His answer was it's always bad timing. So it doesn't fucking matter. Right. You know what I mean? So let us know what we got to do to take care of you. And then he did. It was, it was, it was amazing, you know? So um, we came back. I had about nine months from that decision point before I was actually completely out of the Navy. You know, you go on leave and, and use up all your leave days and all that stuff. And so uh, that was sort of the process for me, which was actually not optimal because when you're retiring or when you're deciding to get out, there's so much to do to prepare for your job, you know, going to courses and things that they provide to help you integrate back into regular society and get your resume built and sort of get your, you know, try to get your mindset ready for that uh, transition phase. And um, I had only nine months to do all that in total and then throw in a hostage rescue uh, that I did while I was on terminal leave. So that's another part of the story that's a little unorthodox for me, but I'm also grateful for is like the very last thing I got to do was a hostage rescue with my squadron because um, I'm trying to think if I want to, how I want to say this, this story, because it's been a while now, but um, so me and another group of recce guys, a few years before that, the standby period at the, at the command is four months where you, you have to be able to get there within an hour, right. And go respond to anything in the world. The recce guys do all the planning for those missions, right? So they got to come in early, early in the morning, spend a little bit, a lot more hours in the planning phase than the tip, than the other operators do, um, than the assaulters do per se. And so when something kicks off, we got to get in there and start planning. Can't be like on trips, training everywhere and doing shit, right? Especially right. if the team advertises that we can go anywhere in like 16 hours max, right? Or whatever it is. There was a certain time where that wasn't the case. And because the average time to respond to anything was giving us like a full day to prepare for before we flew out, some of the officers at the team started getting sort of used to that flow, right? Um, to the point that they had the confidence that we could still go out and do training trips and shit, right? And uh, while we were on standby. So myself and a few other guys uh that i won't name wrote a white paper about how we didn't agree with that and that at least the reggae guys had to not travel but of course what was that seen as it was seen as oh hey the recce guys are trying to get special treatment and spend more time at home than everybody right. else <laughs> <laughs> which is true but that was that wasn't the intention at all right and um that's, that's just the practical like, result but that's, that's like the politics shit that happens yeah yeah, yeah. um so, you know, when I was talking to my wife about the white paper, of course she's happy with it because she's going to see me. She, you know, she's like, oh, you're not going to, you have, you know, a month where you're not going to fucking travel somewhere or whatever. So anyways, they told us to shut the fuck up and not ever write a white paper again. So fast forward to when I was on my leave for terminal leave to get out of the Navy, I had I, my, in, the only thing that, that stopped me from turning in everything and, and, and shutting my locker down completely right was intuition and one of the reasons why now i'm a big believer i wish i trusted my intuition in in many more situations than i did in combat um but i think that also it saved me a couple times so my intuition told me hey you're supposed to you got to turn in all your senses that your guns and your night vision all your equipment some of your gear whatever they're not going to let you have and uh, I did minus just my regular assault gear, um, one gun and one pair of nods because I was like, I'm going to wait till the very last minute to turn this shit in, right? Because it's just my inherent nature as a SEAL to have something ready to go, right? Yep. Um, like, what if fucking, what if, the, what if the Russians or Chinese invade and we have to come back to this base and like right. help the community? Right, right. right. <laughs> what if the base gets attacked? Whatever, something. Yeah, whatever it is. Until I'm uh, home. There's an active shooter on the base. That's happened before. You know what I mean? Right. I got to go help. So uh, my locker was completely cleared out, empty. And I get a call from my troop chief. And he goes, hey, he was an, he was an incoming troop chief. So it was his first rotation as the, as the troop chief, which is the senior enlisted guy in the team, right? Um, and he works with the, the officer. So he goes, hey, um, we have a hostage rescue coming up and 
we don't have enough recce guys here to do the planning. Would you like to come in and help? <laughs> so I giggled and said, like, that's funny. You know, um, you don't have enough recce guys here. You know, um, why do you think I'm that? Is? Did like, you read my white they? paper? Right. <laughs> hey, where are they? I actually had just gone on a jog around my neighborhood and I was all sweaty and I got this phone call and I was like, oh, holy shit. What's this guy calling me? And uh, so we had this conversation, like, where are they? He's like, oh, they're all in Texas at a ranch, like shooting. Mm. <laughs> so I said, awesome. I'm actually glad that they fucking told me to shut the fuck up with that white paper because now I get to go on a hostage rescue. Um, so in all of that time, I never got to go on one. That was my first one. We spun up for a couple, but, uh, uh, you know, I told the troops, hey, yeah, of course I'm going to come in for the planning. And uh, he's like, you got a gun, you got nods, you got, and he knew I was current in my jumping because when we got back from deployment, um, I was like, hey, I was a, um, that's was my other specialty in the team that I, that I picked up that I didn't tell you guys, but I was a, I, I became a jump master and a tandem master. So I got into air off stuff. Um, naturally as a recce guy, I actually wasn't like, it wasn't that fun for me doing that stuff, but I still had that that specialty qualification. So anyways, I went on the jump trip squadron and I was current. So I was current on everything and I had what I needed to, to, to do it. So I said, Hey, yeah, I'll come in for planning. But if I do that, do I get to go on the mission? And he was like, hmm, yeah, I, I can agree to wow. that. So I went and did this hostage rescue in Afghanistan um, in the middle of the summer that I was transitioning out of the Navy. And at the same time, going through the process of a big contracting job with uh, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, DITRA, um, through a local subcontractor that's, that happens to be owned by a friend of mine. And uh, that was my primary, that was my job getting out. And so uh, that helped. I didn't have to go through the whole job hunting kind of mm -hmm. stuff. I, like I had a focus. If that didn't pan out, it would have been a little scary because I didn't have really a backup plan. So like I told you guys before, I, I often operate that way. And things just seem to work out. So, um, so I continued doing that. Right. Um, if that didn't work out, I probably would have adapted and everything and, and, and figured something else out. Right. So, uh, I'm definitely like not a over planner, but not an under planner. I just kind of, kind of, that's just the way I operate. So anyways, um, I went on this hostage rescue. Um, we had multiple, follow on targets to do and then the guys got uh basically extended to stay there in afghanistan for like 60 more days so they ended up doing essentially like a deployment a tour yeah their standby period so that could happen um the wives don't like that because they look forward to that time being home and they're like hey i hope nothing happens because you guys get four months home you know but you could spin up on something you could be sitting on a boat or doing something waiting to respond to a to a, a high value target or a hostage rescue for four months, you know. So anyways, uh, it was a pretty funny story within my squadron because they got extended and I said, all right, guys, hey, thanks for the, you know, thanks for the awesome mission. Uh, I got to go back and uh, get out of the Navy and start my job. <laughs> right. So I flew back and uh, the rest of the recce guys had made it there by then. Um, and it was all good times. Uh, the missions went well. And then I freaking started my job at Ditra a, about a week after that. Well, so how long were you in country um, on the hostage rescue? I was there for about 12 days. Oh, okay. We did, so we did two, two, we did three missions during that 12 days. Cause this is this, this is, we didn't, we did not uh, get the hostages in this case. They had been moved like just before we got there under like a massive underground network of tunnels uh, got it. across the border into Pakistan. So um, the squadron ended up getting those hostages on a later operation, but uh, nevertheless, I still did that hostage rescue. And also I was a tandem master on that. So I tandemed in a, a medic. Um, oh, cool. And I was the recce team leader. So. All right. We're Listen, you still owe me a tandem. I'm just saying, you know. <laughs> yeah, I got you. Okay. Um, all right. Let's 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 talk ice cream, please, because this, this has gotten me really excited, and now I'm hungry for ice cream. So, <laughs> all right. You go to Ditra, all right, but that's not your end game, right? Right. No, that was just my job getting out, and I, I didn't have any idea how how long or far that would go, but my – 
you know, I was friends with the owner of the company. And so, you know, I just wasn't sure of my life at that point. And so that also started the path towards the actual transition, which in my mind, which, what I think for, for veterans is a, is mental. Mm -hmm. Um, your tra to me, transition wasn't complete until I was able to, to sort of like let go of the past, detach from that sort of life and move forward with my purpose and, and what I wanted to be now. Right. And so I figured that out over that time. Um, I was working with a lot of great guys, a lot of cool projects, just really feeling inside, really, un you know, unfulfilled, knowing that that wasn't what I was supposed to be doing. Um, I was making enough money for sure. Uh, and so as the years went on, then COVID happened. And then that was really, you know, that, that kind of fucked everybody up. Right. Um, yep. And you guys know when I say COVID happened, I don't mean anything about a virus, right. COVID <laughs> happened meaning all of our, the, the fucking global reaction to a virus, to a virus. Right. Right. So anyways, that whole situation happened and, and it was a little depressing because it threw my plans off by three years now. Right. I wanted to start that in 2019. Uh, this ice cream thing so i had to put it on ice and sort of continue developing it <laughs> <laughs> exactly so um so now i've started it about four months ago and i'm in a uh that phase of getting my ice cream business certified and approved through the fda getting all my labeling requirements and sort of moving from a local distribution retail sort of bootleg operation but but i had picked up a lot of steam with it in the local community, um, yeah, I started doing these pint drops where I like hype up a flavor on Instagram or social media, um, announce like what day it's going to drop for sales and then sell out. Right. And I, I kept doing that over and over again for the last three or four months, um, to the point where I realized, Hey, I have something that's working. And so now I need to take it to the next step and get, uh, moved into a commercial kitchen and I'm even now looking at uh, lease negotiations for a, a shop. All so. right. I, I apologize. I got to jump in here. Yeah. All yeah right. Jump. So, so, so how does, how does a guy who is Bruce Willis in tears of the sun. Okay. <laughs> reputation for bat who, who goes in country for 12 days to do a hostage rescue and run a, a recce mission. Yeah. How do you, how do you get to, ice yeah, cream yeah. and like goodness yeah. in a cone please explain that yeah so um backtracking um quick quick story about it growing up i was always into cooking i learned all the secrets of my family through my japanese grandmother and my mother um always you know my sisters also learn a little bit but but i think that i was the one who really picked up on that stuff as, as an interest i got an ice cream machine at one point and started making and this was fascinated by it. it's just always been my favorite food. Like if I was on death row and they say, what's your last meal? It's going to be some sort of like ice cream bowl Sunday or something. Right. Not a steak or anything else like that. But so uh, fast forward to the teams um, on some of my deployments, I packed up a machine and I found ways to make ice cream with like camel's milk or goat's milk and produce that I'd send the translators out to get on the market Right. And I was actually pretty quiet about that because I was a little just insecure about stuff like that. Another thing I was insecure about was that like in community college, I majored in theater. <laughs> uh, sorry. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> we all make fun of each other and have fun in the teams. But at the same time, you know, uh, you know, I was just like I, I had this ego of like I have to be, you know, a cool, tough guy. And so um, my insecurities were, were those two things, you know what I mean? So it was kind of on the low, but I did make ice cream for some of my teammates in the hooch and they loved it. And it was just my, it was my thing, you know? So fast forward to now, um, knowing that I was unfulfilled doing this contracting work and, and this thought of like having to work for the government for the rest of my life, um, regardless of how much money I make or not, was where I, I honed in on that intuitional feeling of like, I am going to figure out a way to make ice cream as a, as a job. And so that's what I did. So, uh, a local place it was really the only artisan ice cream type place went out of business here in 2015 and that's what sparked the thought of like hey i can i can do this here you know and so then covid and up to now and so that's that's literally what i'm in the phase of doing right now as we speak so let me let me talk to you about the name of your ice cream company all right so tell us the name and and give us the thought process how you got to that name yeah, so it's called Be Free Craft Ice Cream. And like I said, during that phase, 
of COVID, it gave me time to sort of step back and figure these things out, you know, like a, a vibe, a brand, sort of a logo, the name. So I went through a whole exercise of naming convention stuff um, with a sort of graphic designer friend of mine who does this kind of stuff. And uh, it just started coming together. I started listing out names and vibes and, and things like, you know, color schemes and you know flavors just like everything you can think of really if you were going to start up anything you know um and started just sort of documenting minting it and then just the same thing as we do with a, a concept of operations for a mission is like you have an idea you throw it all down on paper and you just start to refine it into a brief that you would show to somebody and that's literally the process that i went through for that and then the name nobody liked it um Nobody liked it, but there was something that rang a bell out of all the names I came up with. Um, then there was other ones like Ice Cream Nation was a cool name. And then there was like a few other ones. Um, one person liked uh, light, like Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Ice Cream. <laughs> Just a little too long. And, yeah, it's too That's long. That's a good name, though. But, but my point is like I had a whole bunch of them. And there's this one that stood out to me that just stuck in my head. I kept thinking about it when I was sleeping and it was be free. And once one morning, it just like popped a light bulb that was like the whole thing that I'm doing right now with this ice cream, it doesn't matter that it's ice cream, right? It matters that it's, it's something, it's some skill that I have other than tactics, it's my only other skill in life. And it's that you're, doing something that that fulfills you and makes you happy right and that you love and trying to find a way to do that as a living instead of something that you don't want to do it's setting you so free it's setting me free and it, it, it was like this the whole exercise i was going through figuring this out was literally a pathway that i started setting to to freedom for for myself right mental freedom you know job freedom financial freedom just you know internal freedom you know freedom from trauma, freedom from just everything, anything you can think of, right? And so for me, it just made sense that, that 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 was the name. And so it made the most sense to me, but not much sense to everybody else because they didn't they didn't know it was in my mind. I, I wanna I wanna point out two things from what you've already shared with us about this that that at least resonates or, or has a, a a realization for me. I, I don't know, I don't want to speak for you. But you mentioned two things, like number one, um, the way you operate, right, is sort of people give you advice, either solicited or unsolicited, and say, hey, I hear what you're saying, but dot, dot, dot. Right? I appreciate your advice, but I'm going to ignore it. <laughs> be free be, and, and be free, be free is you being authentic and true to yourself saying, I Absolutely. appreciate it, but I'm going to go with my gut instinct here. And yeah. then, and then going back in time to when you were a child, okay, and and your thought process or this draw to join the Navy SEALs in particular, right, was your you said that you you had felt alone and you wanted to be part of something, a brotherhood or a community or yeah. something that that felt like family or nurturing yeah. because you had bounced around and you had to create these relationships over and over again, which were really difficult at that age, right? right? And you did that. You didn't just do it. You did it and you pushed the envelope. You almost got dropped. Right. You learned a valuable lesson and then you exceeded all expectations and enmeshed yourself to the point where the next step was you reached a crossroad. I can either lead other like-minded people who also need this team family or I can be free. I can, I can get out of this, focus on my family, focus on myself, focus on my passions. Absolutely. And that's why it kept you up at night. And that's why you stuck yeah. with that. And all these other names, great to other people. Yeah, it didn't matter. But yeah. Be free is Chris Fettis and Chris Fettis is be free. That's yeah, the absolutely. way I see it. Absolutely. Yep. The freedom to live your life on your own terms, essentially, and whatever that means to, to, to each person. And so it all made sense to me, and I, so I stuck with it and was like, "This is the this is the name, man." Now your it's not just yeah, go ahead. I, I gotta know what's your favorite flavor right now. 
right now I made this, my favorite flavor right now, which is, it's not everyone else's favorite flavor is, uh, it, it's, it's actually hilarious because of the, what we talked about, but it's like, I made this key lime pie flavor. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I got these key limes sent to me from a friend, another seal in Florida, um, who owns a fishing charter now. So he sent me a, uh, some key limes and I made up a flavor, made up a flavor. I served it at a couple different events and people that love key lime pie really love it. Um, the, everyone else's favorite flavor I have right now is this like bourbon vanilla bean yeah. uh, yes, like mine. That's a brownie mine. caramel flavor. It's just like killing it right now. And then yep. the second to that, I think is uh, my, my, I call it cookie commando. It's my version of like, like, uh, um, not not cookie dough but like uh like i put you know crafted chocolate chip cookies in there cookie dough and chocolate chips in vanilla bean ice cream it's just like loaded with cookies and so the the sort of mascot like design for that flavor became the cookie commando which is like a version of the of the um cookie monster but meaner looking with night vision goggles <laughs> have you tried the uh the the classic alternates now like they have sweet and salty or uh, spicy put like peppers yeah. and the... so i experimented with a flavor i haven't done yet actually says when i do these drops i gotta be kind of careful that they're not too uh niche you know what i mean because yeah. a flavor like that would be great for like a steak dinner at a restaurant or something you get a scoop of this like dark chocolate with a little bit of chili spice in it you know what i mean but for people that buy pints of ice cream usually it's like it needs to be something you know you could crush a pint of like while you're sitting around watching a movie or something like that right, you right. know so i think of the flavors that way and i definitely experiment and test with uh some pretty cool different flavors um than the norm but then when i go to make these pints i kind of um try to make it what i not what i think people will like i still am going to do my style of ice cream but it's like i like to take classic flavors like pistachio and make a whole new version of it like for myself so you know the last time i made pistachio i did like i candied the pistachios so they had this crispiness to them um and then i just made this like really killer um you know pistachio butter that i that i blended into ice cream and made this like you know legit legit pistachio flavor so i'll release that into a flavor and it'll probably sell out you know what i mean so uh, if I do like the dark chocolate with spice or like, you know, white, like, or like tomato sorbet with white peach or something like that, those are delicious, but I got to, just, I just think about how I sell those for retail. Yeah, you know the marketing I mean? is the issue. Sure. Yeah. Any vegan now, options? Yeah. Yeah. So I definitely have a vegan formula, but that's another one of those nuances where like when I have a, when I have a shop set up for sure, I'll have a whole vegan yeah. menu because there's a lot of people out there that want that, including myself. Um, but when I do pint drops right now, it's like I'm my phase that I'm doing right now with local retail type stuff. I'm it's not a I'm sort of in a survival phase, but it's not like a really survival. It's like I'm just doing the best that I can as I get going with this storefront, you know, so I can sort of survive, you know, according to the business plan. Um, and then once I get into the shop, then it's like game on. I can sort of start. I've got a headquarters now that I can start reaching out and doing stuff to, but there's only so much I can do out of a commercial kitchen with me and a couple of helpers. Yeah. So I sort of focus on what's working the best, you know, and, and try not to, I've got a million ideas, but one thing I've for sure learned in the last year is that I've got to focus the, those ideas into action. Right. And the rest of it's sort of shiny objects that I can sort of hold on to for later. Now your, your ice creams, all right. First of all, every flavor is artisanal and custom, right? Like yeah. you come up with this in, and, and I'm listening to you talk about these flavors and pairing ice cream with other things, either uh, other, other times like watching a movie or dinner or pairing it with food. Um, yeah. this, this is something you do at a like a five star Michelin restaurant. OK, so the flavoring method so i really i have three ways really one is i have a ton of books like like different recipe books culinary type stuff and i and definitely a lot of books from other craft artisan type ice cream makers but most of them are actually like gelato makers and, and like italian books yeah um 
So I have tons of ideas on flavors in there. Sometimes I go to them when I'm like, like even this week, I'm, I'm like, hey, I got to get ready for an event. I don't know what flavors to make. Um, I can redo the popular ones and they're always happy with that. But when I want to do a new one, I kind of start thinking of like, what do I, what do I just crave right now during this time of year? Or how am I feeling? You know, and I go, hey, I might want to do a chocolate based or a fruit based kind of thing. And then I just start thinking about it. So sometimes I'll just, it'll just pop into my mind. You know, one time I was on a plane and I was like, hey, these fucking chocolate pastry puffs are delicious. I could throw this in like a Boston cream pie, you know, um, flavor. But also that's in my head because I think that's a Jenny's flavor right now. So then I'll just, if that's the case, I'll change it, you know, or just make it. And sometimes it's on the go where I hit up, um, I got a, a, this girl, Allie, who's a pastry chef that's working with me now. And for sure, we're going to, um, she'll, she'll be with me when we start the shop up and with the, and with the business, she's amazing. Um, she'll, she'll, sometimes I'll just hear about things that she makes and I go like, oh my God, that would be delicious in an ice cream. And then I kind of just think of the, whatever the ice cream flavor needs to be to pair with, you know, her cinnamon roll or, uh, like, um, you know, French bread or whatever it is, that, you know, so that's, that's one way. So one way is the books that sort of, sort of gives me ideas through recipes. Another way is just how I feel. And when I think of, I just think it up. And the third way is just when I'm in the kitchen experimenting, um, I'll just start messing around. Like right, right now I'm trying to have a higher protein ice cream so that people that are sort of performers in life or just anybody can get something out of their sweet tooth also, besides just the sweet tooth. Um, companies like Halo Top, they've already got the low calorie thing and that's not real ice cream in my opinion. <laughs> um, anyway, so it's like, if you're doing a thing, if you make hamburgers, right. you know, it's like, you got to just accept that there's got to be meat with it and cheese and, and fat, like all these basic right. things. Like, so if I make ice cream, my, I'm not, if, if I was in the frozen dessert business, that's one thing, but you know, like my goal is to make like, right. you know, elite badass ice cream, like kick-ass ice cream, killer ice cream per se. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. But you know, spe so speaking of that's badass good. ice yeah. cream, speaking of badass ice cream, your branding, in addition to cool names and cool flavors and cool pairings, your branding of your flavors is off the charts because okay. you've you've associate you've actually come up with individual concepts for flavors, haven't you? Yeah, for sure. Some of them, especially you know, I don't know, it just kind of happened. Like, hey man, I had this flavor and a cool name for this banana based flavor. You know, I ran a like a little Instagram competition and got people coming back to the comments with suggestions and then like you win like a pack of stickers or some free pints or whatever was like guerrilla warfare. And I'm like, that's awesome. That's a great name for a yeah. banana based ice cream. So I'm going to make a design out of it. Now I have a, you know, a guerrilla warfare slap sticker sort of t-shirt design kind of thing too. So it's kind of helping to pair flavors with cool names because then it, it, it opens up the the door for merchandise sort of stuff out of it. Yeah. yeah. Merch. You know, and, and, and people just, it's just, <clears throat> people seem to, uh, it's, it's just like catching their eye aside from just like the ice cream flavor itself. You know what I mean? Some yeah, people the, like the Ben and Jerry's flavor names more than they like the flavors. So, you know, yeah, those, exactly. those crazy names there, that's part of the whole marketing concept. So, yeah. Yeah, part of it, yeah, exactly. So it just opens up the door for marketing. Um, and I don't have to do that with every flavor, but some of them are just easier to do. You know what I mean? It's fun. Um, yeah, especially the ones that, that I name after uh, fallen teammates as like memorials for them. But like that's my way of memorializing is through my ice cream, right? And so I can envision containers in the future having like some little blur with a little mini picture of them that kind of tells you some some story about them, right? So that when you're eating the ice cream, you feel this sense of, uh, you know, compassion towards them and some sort of so, sort of memorialized, memorialized yeah. respect towards that that person you know and, and it just just makes sense to me you know in the way that i'm doing it yeah so you you and i have spoken offline you know i'm i'm in the crossfit space um it's one of the things i like to do for my mental health um physical activity um and it's it's big in you know the military community it's modeled after you know military style workouts and whatnot and a lot of our workouts are 
what we call hero workouts for fallen yeah. service men and women, you know, from the armed forces as well as first responders and whatnot. And I think that what you brought to the ice cream space is is similar in in nature and it's incredibly powerful and important and a great way i think to carry on the legacy of of these fallen heroes um with something that everybody can get behind you know yeah. it you know yeah, like everybody loves ice cream <laughs> exactly exactly everybody loves ice cream and and an ice cream with a story you know for you know ice cream with a story with slaps with cool logos and yeah. cool designs <laughs> and and the most important factor tastes ridiculously good yeah yeah right thank you I, it's not I mean, ice cream they, anymore it's a whole experience right yeah right. yeah exactly right so uh, speaking so, of names by the way and i i'm sorry to interrupt but can we call you mr softy from now on yeah no. whatever you want oh no we're not calling <laughs> you mr softy <laughs> okay you know what's funny about that is like my thing is i've gone through so many of these selections where they're calling you names and like trying to like <laughs> stir you up and like get a reaction out of you that I bet. <laughs> um no it doesn't apply to every guy some guys do have big egos they can't take it but i'm like you can call me whatever you want i'm not going to react to it you know? <laughs> uh, any listen when you get yourself situated in the storefront is is operational and things settle down i do want to do collaborations with you for Absolutely. these hero workouts because yeah. on my end they're incredibly motivational and people want to support veteran owned businesses and people want to get behind the cause um it's very emotional for people, whether they're, they've been in the service or not. Um, it's something that really resonates deeply, um, with a lot of people for, for many similar reasons. Yeah. And I think it would be a great way to promote what you're doing. Um, and I, you know, to whatever extent I can, I can assist with that. Yeah. That's you awesome. Know. Definitely get into yeah. That. I've got an yeah. event, uh, Friday for a CrossFit gym out here too. Um, so I'm coming up with, I'm literally coming up with some flavor ideas for that. So I'll be, you know, knocking those out in the next day or two. If you decide right, to incorporate chilies into your uh, recipes, I grow hot peppers. So yeah, I'm thing. happy to. I need to get some, I need to get some from you. All right. So when you come up here. Oh yeah. Months, I got a, a uh, huge Tabasco brush growing right now. There's like 800 peppers. Yeah. On it, so a little bit of, a little bit of spicy goes with sweet um, yeah. for sure. And it works on ice cream too. Yeah, yeah. So let me let me ask you just as a as a as a veteran. All right, you you spoke a little bit about mental health and how important it is, you know, and and how much it, it's affected when you get out. Has ice cream and and setting up be free and all these things that you're going through now? Do you find that that helps you with with mental health? Yeah, absolutely helps me. I mean, it's my meditation when I throw those headphones in and I'm cranking out ice cream. So that that's the meaning of, that's what I mean by it, where some people that are sort of, I don't want to say stuck, but that p people that just don't seem to get those, those concepts are like, like I said, it doesn't matter what you do. You know what I mean? It's your, it's your meditation. It's what you, it's what calms you. Right. So between yep. all the stress of getting my business plan together and trying to, you know, stick to my projections on revenue that I got to make so that I have enough cash flow when I first start the shop, you know, to making sure all my numbers are accurate and still making ice cream for these events and doing, it's just, it's, it's stressful and it's a lot, but at the same time, it is all in line with my mental health requirements because it's what I'm, it's what I'm doing. It's, 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 it's my purpose now. It's part of my purpose at least. And um, that's what I needed to find. And so not having that coming out of the teams, like going from such a profound sense of purpose as a seal to where like that, is, that, that is your purpose per se. Like I understand now that it's not your total purpose in life, but in those moments it is really. And that's right. the way it has to be for, for, you know, elite level special forces teams to operate. It has to be everybody's purpose in life. Right. 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 Um, you cannot understand it any other way. And that's, that's the machine. But when you're done and that's why the transition is so hard is like, you do now have a purpose outside of a soft operator, right? You, you're, you can, you now have to realize that you have a spirit inside, right? Right. Um, you had that the whole time anyways, but now you just have to realize that it's okay to connect to that 
right? And 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 you, if there's a, that's the struggle is figuring out what is my purpose now after that, right? And then there's two paths you can take, and the reason why we have such a huge problem with veteran suicide and 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 you know one path, um, and then the other path is you really you really figure out a way to understand your purpose, let go of the things you just don't need anymore to include like addictions and, um, you know, things that you may or may not have picked up during your time in the team or even before that and, and letting go of those things. And so for me, like the ice cream, like you said, it I don't have time for anything else. else. It's my family and my, and my ice cream, you know? Right. Um, I was going to get to that. So I wanted to ask yeah. you and, and sort of the thread of family, right? You mentioned this really emotional story about FaceTiming your son. All right. And now, you know, we're watching on Instagram when your family comes together and they're helping you with packaging and slaps yeah. and, and taste testing. And yeah, yeah. so, so how important is family to this business and, and to where you're at now? Yeah, it's, it's so important, you know, because um, it's just so important. It's, it's my purpose in life, right? So it's, it's like self, family, and whatever it is that you do, right? Um, and to try to keep a balance of mind, body, and spirit, right, all together. Um, and my family has been, that, that, that's who it's for, right? And they, they are me. So that's also part of the struggle is staying in line with that, right? Because um, I'm nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect, even though I understand this and I've been able to move to a place where I, where I, where I get these things, I still struggle with, um, the, you know, like the daily grind and arguments and, you know, the kids fighting and, um, <laughs> That's you know, life. judging yourself because you're like, man, I woke up today and I like, didn't get anything done. Right. And you, you, you forget about the things that you did get done. Right. Or you, or you needed a day to rest and just fucking reset or something, you know, but, um, you know, I'm going through that right now. I haven't done, I've been doing events, but I haven't been able to do these big pint drops like I was doing during, during the summer because now I'm on the FDA's radar and I need to get approved, right? I need, I need the thumbs up. So now I can go start crushing it again. And it's just like this, this, it's just like the same thing, staying connected to your family, right? And yourself, like finding the time to, like when I wake up in the morning, I can't just go right into my fucking social media or news right or just or i disconnect from myself and then it causes strain between my family and what i'm doing with the ice cream so it's right. like i gotta get up in the morning i have to have a routine to connect to myself go for a walk take the dogs meditate whatever it is first right and then get into the grind of the day and then the day just ends up being so much better and more productive after that but then keeping that going day after day after day right so it's just, it's the same struggle right but um, the purpose is all behind it and, and there is no purpose without, without the family. So, right. Or, you know, there is, but it's, it's just, it's discombobulated, it's disconnected and it's not whole, you know? Yep. So where do you see yourself be free in five years from now? Uh, you know, I don't know, but according to the plan, by that time I will be distributing, pints and other original products which i could i could tell you now but i don't want to give the secret out i just want people yep, to kind yep. of see it so i got a pretty a, i got a few pretty awesome original product ideas aside from just the pints of ice cream themselves right um and i'm already going to get going with the the way that i do the design and sort of vibe of my pints of ice cream so I've just shifted from doing these like paper cups, like the generic paper cups with my sticker logo and the kids helping me, like you said, to like my first, you know, custom containers that'll probably be what, something close to what you'll, you'll be seeing in the store, like in a, in a couple of years. Right. So next step is the headquarters, right. Get that operational, get that smooth, you know, and then start distributing pints. Well, I'll be, I'm already doing local distribution just on my own um in other people's businesses and stuff like that so that'll pick up but uh in five years for sure i'll be i, I think i'll be a, a national ice cream brand i think so too and I, I gotta be honest i can't wait to see the be free ice cream truck coming down the road here in uh, long beach new york yeah just yeah. saying 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Are you considering like retail locations like uh, like Baskin Robbins or something like that, or it's just going to be prepackaged? Um, that depends. So we'll see how the model goes. But but for right now, my focus is on retail and distribution. You know, maybe some some wholesale type stuff, but um, not so much franchising the shop right to to different locations. But if it does well, and I can sort of uh, record that that model and make it sort of cookie cutter and it makes sense then then i then i would do that you know what i mean um and other other brands and businesses i'm sort of using them as as examples um just the ones that are similar to what i'm doing you know i don't want to go i'm no blue bunny or any of that kind of stuff i'm like in this sort of newer craft artisan um realm of like salt and straw and jenny's and I think I might be one of the, the first veteran owned vibe type brands that, that, that you see in the store anyways. Um, so we'll see how it goes, but um, you got to have your sure, ice cream in every PX, every PX. Yeah. Every yeah. PX for sure. Um, my model, we've, the way that we've done it is so that I can, it's, so, it's sort of like the same way we did um, mission planning in the teams. Mm-hmm. It's like, Hey, if this happens, I can adapt and here's what I'll do. Right. It's like here's the plan, but if this shifts, here's 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 what I could do, like to adapt to that shift, and so I can sort of plug and play um, different ideas and plans regarding franchising or retail or just the storefront. You know what I mean? Um, so all that kind of stuff. Well, it sounds incredibly exciting, and it sounds like you're well on your way accomplishing all those tasks and if your past is any indicator of what your future holds i think that we can rest assured that you will get the mission accomplished yeah 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 Yeah, so whether whether it goes to to the plans or historically if i wing it a little bit and it's a combination of both right that's probably what's going to end up being but either way you're going to see it so for sure for sure um all right so i i think before we, we close out, question, and we'll, we'll edit this. Do you want to talk at all about F2S? Yeah, that'd be cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess how I can start is that like me and you, me and, me and you became friends around this time last year, maybe when you guys started looking to schedule out some training and I was working at GBRS group for a little bit and um, we started just getting getting tighter man we started talking on the phone all the time and coming up with cool ideas for stuff i was actually thinking about doing um training on my own after you know because i have to say like the plan with them was always like i was going to work full time with them for me it was a step off to do something more fun with some buddies that were doing something awesome right and and my role there was it was sort of like um scheduling and organizing training training blocks. And so I knew I was going to do that full time for a few months to step off of my government contracting gig. Right. And then kick off my, my ice cream startup. And so that's exactly what I did. Um, but as I did that, me and you became friends and I for sure was thinking about, uh, you know, like, Hey, I still got to stay current, you know, and I still got to train. So, um, we started having some common thoughts or like some common ground on, particulars that are going on you know out in the environment to these days with like um, dangers like active shooters and these different um, sort of dangerous scenarios going on right and the politics behind it I'm, I'm sober and sort of agnostic to but to my point is that like is when something's happening in your environment it's a waste of time to go say like whose fault is it that it's like this or why is it like this now? Right. Or um, come up with sort of absurd ideas on, on, on solutions for the problem that are not solutions at all, you know, because it seems like these days where it's like, Hey, there's active shooters. We have to, I don't want to get into politics too much, but it's like, if we just ban all guns, then it'll solve the problem. And then you're like, well, there's so many questions to that. Like how long does that take? Right. And can you actually even accomplish that without, just completely nullifying people's rights right that mm-hmm. that are in the construct of the of our whole identity as a country right i think the answer is no um but even if it is 
the timeline for that doesn't line up with the threat that's going on right now and what we have to do to adapt to that threat. So um, in this case, that's when me and Izzy started coming up with ideas like, hey, these active shooter things, right? And, and in your role with, with your guys' team, both of you guys, um, it's like, this is what you guys do, you know? You are of service to protect places of worship. Um, and it's all the same as schools. It's it, it like, it, it applies to, to everything, right? There's threat, there's, there's obvious threats now um, that there's no time to waste, you know, thinking about, thinking around it right? As opposed to adapting directly to it. So we have some ideas for products, right? And I don't know, yes. I'll, leave it, I'll leave it up to you to expose that, like exactly what we're working on, but we're working on some cool freaking solutions um, that are not, you know, outside the realm of feasible, like, hey, every teacher should be a tactical expert, you know what I mean? Which is right. just not going to get that, right? Train teachers right. how to keep, a, and then keep a gun and you're talking about a whole nother laundry list of safety issues and differences in schools and different places like a school in fucking you know east la is different from a school here in in virginia beach virginia you know what i mean so how do you how do you make decisions on like levels of threats and different things like that in those different schools so i think that's kind of a waste of time when we can get after actual solutions so right yeah i i i think again calling from our previous conversations, I think it was fortuitous, similar to you sort of getting in trouble in Key West, you know, you, you have to have that, that oh shit moment maybe um, to sort of change the, tra the trajectory of the direction you're going in. And, you know, what Dave and I do in our communities um, and what we do with our, our team uh, led us to seek training from, you know, people that we feel are, are the best in the business. And that's what brought us together. And like you said, um, it was that, that common thought process, if you will, right. That connected us and started a conversation um, that brought us now a year later uh, into a collaboration to do things, to make a difference, to take, to change the trajectory of things that are maybe not being done, but people think are being done, but don't work, right? So we're looking for innovative solutions, both in action and then in products. And, yeah. and like you said, we're working on something now that, that in the next couple months, we will be able to reveal on a much grander scale. And I want to <laughs> yeah. thank you. I want to thank you, Chris, because your role in this, this whole podcast, everything that you've discussed, I hope we will be able to, display that for people to see in a way that words couldn't describe but your actions will will speak volumes you know and i i hope that the crossover to your ice cream business um is equally impactful and and that the results blow everything out of the water you know in the most positive way uh, and like you said our solutions and the, the what we're bringing to the table is devoid of politics. It has nothing to do with politics. It's not right. this side of the aisle, that side of the aisle. It's po political free and designed to, to save lives and, and enhance people's ability to act as their own first responders. Absolutely. Yep. Right. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. And <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward also to be a big advocate for the ice cream. I'm, we're, it's sold here in Long Island. We just got to get <laughs> yeah, it here. Yeah. So when you're ready, we're, we're ready to receive you. We support you yeah. in whatever capacity we can. Um, and I, I want to just thank you for taking all this time out of your day. We've been talking oh, about pleasure in this. Yeah, it was a you good know? one. I actually, I haven't gotten into nearly as many details about some of the stuff with anyone else before you guys. So it's, it's, it's good. It's, it's thank good, you. Uh, it's a good time. Yeah, well, the, the, you're, you're part of the team. So we're, we're really <laughs> lucky, fortunate, and grateful all rolled into one. Yes, and thank sir. you so much for your service. Absolutely. Yes. My pleasure. I do it all over again. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. All you. right. So thank you. I'm going to let you get back to your stuff and um, we'll try to schedule another one of these. Yeah. You know, to keep good. building. Yeah, we'll get into more for sure. All right. Like awesome. you said, I think it'll be a good idea. We start getting into, um, we'll start, you know, growing this sort of 
this this discussion, this podcast thing, start talking about you know, have some video breakdowns of things going on, training video, yep. like anything you guys want to get into, and um, it's going to be a good time. I'm I'm grateful. Awesome. Okay. All right, Chris. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you guys. All right. Take care.